Uh, I totally forgot uh, earlier to say the, uh, you probably saw it already on the website I posted it yesterday, the, the grading for the second assignment is a little delayed again, so I hope that it's done by Monday. Um, my apologies for that, that it takes so long. It's, uh, I don't like that and I already made a note that next year we have to arrange it in a different way to avoid it because of course it would be good for you to get the, the feedback uh, before you uh, have to finish the third one which is next week. Um, but it's just, yeah, I, I, I want you, we're doing this for the first time and there are always things that you cannot plan, you just run into them when you do it and then there has been some, some other things which were un beyond our control, for example, I was not able to log in with my Unix account, which I need to access the system. And uh, on that day, of course, our system administrator was on vacation, so I could distribute it a day later only. And these are the kind of things that uh, that just happened, but a lot of things came together and that caused this delay. So uh, yeah, sorry for that, but yeah, we have to live with it. Um, we're trying to uh, um, maybe make up for it a little bit by having a little more teaching assistance next week or maybe have another session so uh, most likely we will have uh, more sessions on another session on Thursday at least which is the day of the deadline but since there is no lecture it's kind of uh, yeah obvious that we're trying to have another another uh, teaching assistant there earlier so you can also go there and, and ask questions so uh, yeah Good. Um, yeah, I will we'll talk to the teaching assistants later and then uh, probably post it on Friday. If not at the latest on Monday, I will post when at what times next week teaching assistants will be available. Good. So let's go to uh, ray tracing again. So we, we know the basics now and now we want to do some interesting stuff, some more fancy stuff, fancy stuff. So for example, like here, you see on this piano we have a shadow that they implemented last year and we already talked about shadow with projective methods. Now for ray tracing, shadows are quite nice because they kind of integrate well in this general approach of shooting rays and looking how they uh, how uh, looking what we hit and how that influences the color. And uh, so when we want to do shadows in ray tracing, one of the common, most common approaches is so-called shadow rays or shadow feelers, which is basically just shoot a ray towards the light source and then see if we see the lights, if it hits the light source or if it hits an object. If it hits the objects, we're in the in the shadow. If not, then we see the light, so we're not in the shadow. So we have a ray. P plus TL from a specific point, and L is the direction from the light source. So this is now the reverse direction from the light source. So from here, we look to the light source. And yeah, you remember this is a directed light, so we have only have a direction. So we take the same vector for these points here, and we create a ray with it. That's pretty straightforward. And if we implement a ray tracer, we have already implemented that. So that's the beauty of it. We just need to reuse some of the code that we already have. Then we shoot an additional ray into the direction of the light source. If that ray hits the object, of course, we know there is an object blocking the view to the light, which means the light is blocked, so we're in the shadow. And if not, then we're, um, we see the light, so we're not in the shadow. And uh, the only thing that when we implement it that we have to be careful now is that uh, we have potential precision problems uh, in accuracy very close to this t equals zero which means why in practice we often shoot the ray from a point that is a little elevated from this point in the direction of the ray. So we take this point P plus epsilon L, and epsilon is just a small uh, small value. So don't, don't uh, misunderstand this here. Here the T is a parameter, whereas here this epsilon is a constant value. So this is just a small value, and that means this here is a point and not a line, although it looks the same here. But by making this epsilon a value, then of course it becomes a point. And so we're just shooting it from this point here. Um, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so this is pretty si simple. Another thing that is actually quite simple and quite easy to do with ray tracing is so-called uh, perfect reflection or ideal specular or mirror of reflection. So this is basically just, uh, this is implementing something like a mirror, a surface that does a perfect reflection. And the key 
characteristic of a reflection is, we already uh, uh, kind of mentioned that with relation to, I think, the font shading, is that um, when you have a mirror, then the key characteristic of a mirror is that if you have an eye position, and if you look at the mirror it, with a certain direction D, then the spot that you see here with a perfect reflection is the same spot that you would see when you are here at this position and look in the direction of the reflection vector, which is defined as the same vector mirrored by the normal with the, with the same angle here. So if there is something, some object here, then the mirror would, ex would show it exactly here. And then you would see that in the same way as if you look, would look from here. And that means we can easily calculate it if we have this reflection vector. And we talked about a reflection vector before, but I think we haven't calculated it. But it is uh, actually relatively simple. It's uh, probably not that obvious, but if you look at the uh, trigonometric uh, relation, then you, you see it. I can, I left some space here so I can easily draw it. So what we have is we have a normal vector, we have a direction, ah, a normal vector and the direction in which we are looking at, and we want now to have the reflection vector, which is, should be the same size as the, so that looks better. Um, and not only the same size, but also the same same angle theta here. Now the question is, we have n and we have d, we want, and we have theta, and we want to have this uh, vector r. One of the ways how we get from here to here, which is what describes this vector, is we can take the vector d, go down here, and that's why they have to be the same size. And now if we go straight up here, then we end up at this vector here. So this is the same distance, and we know this is d, so we just have to know the length of this one vector, or I conveniently already drew it as two vectors, because one of them is easy to calculate. And the uh, trick is, if we see that this is a triangle, from trigonometry, we know that the angles of a triangle, the, the sum of the angle of a triangle is 180 degree. So if this is 90 and this is theta, then this here is 100, let's call that, I don't know, alpha. Alpha is 180 degree minus 90 degree minus theta. And that also leads to, this is the same here, 90 degrees minus theta because this is 90 degrees. And then you also see that, that this here must be theta. And then you see that this here, this has the same direction as the normal vector. It only has a different length. So this is some length lambda times n, the same here, lambda times n. And if you look at the triangle, then you see that lambda is the cosine of theta times n. And we know that the cosine is the scalar product of n times d if they are unit vectors. Otherwise, the scalar product is cosine phi times the length of n times the length of d, which is one for unit vectors. So we know we can describe this vector r by vector d plus 2 times n times n scalar product with d times the vector n. And this is exactly what we have here.
So it looks complicated, but it is pretty straightforward. Good. <coughs> another uh, another uh, visual effect that we have is so far we always always talked about light reflecting from a surface, but of course we also have surfaces or material where the light isn't only reflected, but where the light also goes through. For example, glass, water is all material where we can sh where a light goes through. And when we look at this, what happens in nature when light goes through a surface like this, uh, through a material like this, one thing is that the color can change because some materials don't leave all the color, uh, let all the color spectrum uh, colors of the spectrum through, and also the direction can change. Depend, like if you have a glass and you shoot a light through it, then uh, it is a little changes a little bit the direction, or it is, as a technical term, is refracted, and this is uh, the the refraction that you can also uh, re relatively easily do in in uh, ray tracing. And uh, to do that, so so what what we have here, we have a, a vector that goes here. It's called D for direction that hits a surface at a specific point. So we get the normal at this surface and we can calculate the angle. And now we want to know how much this vector is then, how, how this vector continues. So if it would not be, if it would just go straight through and would not be refracted, of course it would just straightly continue here, but it is refracted by a certain angle we can either say by this angle, or if we draw the normal, then we can say it's distracted by this vector phi. And of course, we use this phi because it's for the calculation easier. Now, this diffraction depends, of course, on the material, what kind of material we have and how it lets, lets light go through, and um, also on the material that, where it comes from. And there is something called uh, Snell's law, which is describes this uh, relationship between these two angles and the, the, the characteristic of the material. And that is n sine of theta is the same as nt sine phi. So the signs are clear, are from these angles here. And the n's are the so-called refractive indices that basically depend on this uh, media. So we usually talk about uh, the source and the target media which is why there is a T index for this N. And uh, yeah, that, that is just like a factor that we have to set for the, for the material and different material has different material uh, of, uh, refraction indices, of course. And um, you also see that this is then, um, because of this equation, it's kind of symmetric. So if we move from that medium, then of course we have this angle phi here, then it gets refracted again, and because of that condition, you see that this angle has to be the same here, theta. So we see we have the same direction here again, but of course also here it, it switches. So this is now the source medium, and this is now the target medium. But since there are, this equation is symmetric, uh, you see of course that you get then the same angle again. So you see this, the, the theory is pretty straightforward. The question is now how we get this, this one vector here. And uh, or, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we used uh, Snell's law for it. Um, before we calculate the, the vector, uh, something else. We, uh, of course, we often want to calculate with cosine and not with sine because I hope you know why. Because there's an easy way to calculate the cosine, which is the scalar product, especially when we're dealing with unit vectors, then we can just calculate the scalar product of them and then we have the cosine. And that doesn't work with the sine, which is why we prefer to have cosines. And uh, we can write um, Snell's law, which expresses with the cosine. So this looks more complicated, but it is easier to calculate because in that case, we don't need the uh, to calculate a trigonometric function, but we can use the scalar product. And to see that, that's not that straightforward to see, but it's actually pretty uh, tr uh, pretty simple to, to calculate if you know this trigonometric identity. So this is just a, uh, um, a characteristic of trigonometric functions that you can prove 
that it uh, that is always the case that the sine to the power of 2 plus the cosine to the power of 2 of the same angle equals always 1. Now if we take Snell's law we can also write it that way. That is just uh, bringing this here to the side and then switching the order of course. Um, we can take the trigonometric identity and write it in that way that we have either the cosine or the sine to the power of 2 on one side. And um, now if we did that, then we can also of course make this to the power of 2. That should also be the same. And then we can say, let's take this equation here, cosine to the power of 2 phi equals 1 minus, and now we take the sine from here, put it in that equation, then we get n divided by nt to the power of 2 sine of theta to the power of 2. So this is a product, so we can do the power of 2 individually. And now we still have a sign here. We want to get rid of that. This here, what I said, is just a general uh, trigonometric uh, characteristic. So I could also call this alpha or anything else. This is, of course, then the concrete case that we have in our scene that we want to model. So here we cannot just change the angle, but this is just again generic. And I have chosen phi here because that is the one that we used here. But I could also call this theta. So if I put that into this here, so if I take this and put that into here, I get here cosine to the power of 2 equals 1 minus n divided by nt to the power of 2 times 1 minus cosine to the power of 2 theta. And that's exactly what we have here, written a little bit differently, but it's exactly the same. So you see, it looks more complicated, but you can easily calculate it. Uh, you, you can easily understand why it is the same, and then you don't have to calculate the signs. But we're still looking for this refraction vector t. And um, now, so to get this t, of course, the first thing is we need uh, we need um, we need the angle and um, the other thing is, of course, we should normalize our vectors here. I tried to indicate this with this dotted line here. So this is all the lengths of 1 now. And uh, what we can do is we can express this vector t as a linear combination. And to do that, we define ourselves an orthonormal basis. Remember, when we have two vectors in 2D that are not linearly, uh, not parallel, not linearly dependent, they form a 2D basis. If they have a right angle to each other, if they are orthogonal, we have an orthogonal basis. And if they are normalized, if they are unit vectors, then we have an orthonormal basis. So we normalize the vectors here. And uh, what we do now is we create a vector B that is on the object and in the same plane as d and n. And that vector now defines a uh, orthonormal basis with, for example, the vector n, because they have a right angle, of course, because n is always in a right angle to the surface. And if b is on the surface, then they have a right angle. And that means we can express the vector t as a linear combination of those two uh, vectors. And um, <coughs> let's, uh, let's see how we can do this. So we can express t and also d as a linear combination of those two vectors. The vectors are b and minus n. So we are choosing this here. Because then the, the representation of t is easier as a basis. And um, if you look now at, let's draw it here. If this is our vector n, and this is our vector b, uh, minus n, sorry. And uh, this is now our vector t. And then, of course, this t is a linear combination of these two vectors. So t is sum xt times this vector. So this is this part here. 
So this is the xt, the length, plus yt, xt times, uh, yt times minus n. So that's this here, yt minus n. But we also know that this is our vector phi. And that way we see easily that xt is sine phi and yt is the cosine of phi. And that's exactly what we have here. And for d we can do it likewise. Also express it as a linear combination of those two vectors. Now what we want is we want t, we have d, we have the angles and we have the normal vector. What we don't have is this vector b and we want t. So we have to change that, we have to solve this for b because here b is the only unknown. So we solve this for b, and then we can put b into t because here b is the only unknown. That gives us this here. So you see here, this is, this here is exactly our b. All the rest is the same as here, all known values. <coughs> um, well, known values in so far as we can calculate them with Snell's law. So remember Snell's law was uh, n time sine of theta equals n t sine of phi and that you can change that of course and then you can put this result into here and that gives you this here removes the sign here and then we already calculated set that we can represent the cosine By, by this equation here, and then the cosine as a, a scalar product, which is then this here. And you see this looks very complex, but it is actually uh, simple in so far as we, for example, have no trigonometric uh, functions to calculate here. So we can calculate our refraction vector, and then we can consider that in the ray tracing. Good. Um, are there any questions so far? No? Because the next two techniques are then not related to the shading, but more to the geometry of ray tracing. And I'm not sure if I can go through all of them today, which is why I would say I'll probably move that to next week and uh, close a little earlier today. All right, then see you again on Tuesday.